black holes and cones, two very different objects with one striking similarity. They both contain what's known as a singularity. Where a black hole is a three-dimensional mass that is gravitationally collapsed, sending all of the matter that comprises it to a single point, a cone is a two-dimensional surface with infinite curvature arising at the tip in the form of a conical singularity where any path drawn to it will meet at a single point. So we have black holes, anything that falls in reaches a single point, and cones, any path extended towards the tip reaches a single point. Black hole, single point, cone, single point. A black hole and a cone. Oh. Are you getting it? This is one device. All right, so all jokes aside, although they're for the most part the same, the one difference that we'll focus on between these two devices is that a black hole exists in three dimensions while a cone exists in two dimensions. Notice that our two-dimensional caped hero can never leave the surface of this cone. This is because a cone is essentially a two-dimensional surface, albeit a two-dimensional surface with a singularity in it. Now, what lies on the other side of a black hole has remained unrivaled in capturing our curiosity since their mathematical discovery over 100 years ago. And this is no less true when compared with our curiosity of, well, a cone. However, maybe this cone can provide us with the answers we're looking for. First, let's look at the analogy between three and two dimensions and see why it's impossible to simply look around the other side of a black hole. You could circle around it for all eternity, but never see the other side of which it leads to. This is the same in both 3D and 2D. So the only way to see the other side would be to go through it. Of course, doing that would kill you before you even reach the other side. Fortunately for us though, being one dimension greater than the surface of a cone, we can visualize what would happen if a two-dimensional being fell through the tip. Keep in mind that there's always an analogy from a lower dimension to a higher dimension. If this were not the case, existence would break at the seams. So we'll be utilizing what's known as dimensional analogy the study of how n minus 1 dimensions relate to n dimensions. In popular science, you'll often see this method used to describe four dimensions from three dimensions. In this case, however, we'll be using two dimensions to describe three dimensions. So we'll take a cone in which exists a two-dimensional universe and add an unfortunate astronaut who will be required to go to the tip. This line you can just imagine as this astronaut's path. In 3D, this would be the equivalent of a line tracing out your path as you moved around. So the question we want the answer to is where does this line continue on after reaching the tip? And before we attempt to answer that, there are three things that we must keep in mind in order to make this analogy perfect to a black hole in three dimensions. The first is that no line extended to the tip may traverse over the tip. This is because singularities cause paths to become incomplete and inextendable locally. Also, geodesic equations go haywire when paths reach the tip. But mainly, it's because nothing can escape a black hole. The second is that no line may terminate indefinitely at the tip. So we cannot just extend a line to the tip, have it remain there forever, and call it a day. This is because Stephen Hawking showed that black holes eventually evaporate, leaving nothing behind. This would eventually force the path to extend on somewhere. The final rule is that every line that starts on the surface of the cone must remain on the surface of the cone. This means the line can't just go off into some higher dimension, parallel universe, or anywhere else. It must remain on the cone. This is akin to the law of conservation of mass, which states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. In this case, destroyed. And these three restrictions give rise to a classical interpretation of the black hole information loss paradox. Classical meaning we're not taking into account quantum theory or relativity. 
strictly mechanical. Alas, we can determine where this line must go upon reaching the tip. The only place left, given these conditions, is to the other side of the surface. The only thing left to do now is to draw an analogy from this and all its consequences to a three-dimensional world. But there might be one thing that you noticed in regards to rule number one possibly being broken when going to this other side. A true two-dimensional universe has no width. Therefore, both of these sides are embedded in each other, and this might lead one to conclude that these two sides are one in the exact same space, i.e. that an observer would view the same exact thing no matter which side they were on. But this is not the case, because this is a parody inversion. If this two-dimensional observer's path takes them through the hole to the other side, Everything from the side they just came from is now mirrored. In technical terms, a parity inversion has occurred. Notice the A is on the right side of the observer, the red eye. But on this side, the A is on the left side of the observer, the green eye. Notice, neither of the eye colors of the observer has changed in this process. This is because if the right eye, the red eye, is the first into the hole, then the red eye is also the first out of the hole. Since the observer's parity does not change with respect to themselves, but the rest of the universe does, this concludes in the two-dimensional space that although the two sides are embedded within each other, they are not one and the same. If you're having trouble visualizing what's happening here, just imagine taking a righty baseball glove throwing it into a hole in the fabric of space-time, and it coming out as a lefty glove. From the perspective of the glove, though, after falling in, it still remains the same, but everything else around it becomes mirrored. This is essentially what's happening here. Also, if you know a little bit about charge parity time reversal symmetry, yes, this means exactly what you think it means. So rule number one has been respected, and now we can finally move on to the analogy of three dimensions. These two separate two-dimensional beings, this one on this side and this one on this side, both exist within the same two-dimensional universe since both sides of this universe are embedded within each other. This means that either one of these two beings could occupy any of the space within their universe, and therefore would also be able to move around each other within this universe as well. With the only difference between the two being that we know of so far, that their parity is inverted with respect to each other. Now the analogy from that to three dimensions would be that myself and this other three-dimensional being can exist in the same universe, but be on opposite sides of each other. Of course, with our parity inverted relative to each other. Now notice that although I can see this room completely normal, he sees it entirely mirrored. Yup, can confirm. Now since we both exist in the same universe, either of us can occupy any of the same spaces within this universe. And that would also mean that we can move around each other. Just like that. Remember, if it can happen in a lower dimension, it must have an analogy to a higher dimension. Since higher ones are just extensions of lower ones. Facts. Another cool thing that we can do since we exist in the same universe is touch. What up? Now we need to discuss real quick the consequences of a universe having a parity inverted other side to it. Why did him and I cause an explosion when we touched? This is because he's actually my antimatter counterpart. This in physics is due to something called charge parity time reversal symmetry. 
I'm not going to go nuts talking about that. You can Google it. There's a whole Wikipedia page on it. But it states that when two of these three things is inverted, the third must also necessarily be inverted as well. As we've seen on the other side, parity is inverted. Time is inverted because when you take the curvature of gravity into account in the two-dimensional analogy, you get objects on opposite sides being gravitationally repulsive. This is the equivalence of momenta being reversed, which is like pressing rewind on a falling object. So we have parity reversed on that other side, time reversed on that other side, and therefore necessarily charge must be inverted on that other side. So all objects on this other side are our antimatter counterparts. No, 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 no. You're actually my antimatter counterpart. Also, since you have to go through a black hole to even get to the other side, and you can't gain information about an object after it's fallen into a black hole, he would technically be invisible right now. And we would be invisible to him as well. And since he's on the other side of the Earth's gravitational field, he would be gravitating upwards. And he's gonna hit the ceiling. In summation, go through a black hole, end up on the other side of the fabric of space-time, all derived from a dimensional analogy from two dimensions. Of course, this means nothing without the math backing it up. So join me in the next video, interpreting the region of negative radius within general relativity. Alright, peace out.